Discipleship, becoming more like Christ, is not a do-it-yourself project. And if you don't have other voices speaking into you and into your life, you will become weird. And that's not God's will. That's why you've got to have people around you who can help you so you're learning, you're being encouraged in the Word of God. We are in a series on the book of Acts, if you're new today, that we've entitled the series Power Today, and we come to Acts chapter 23. Acts chapter 23, where the title of the message is A Clear Conscience. A Clear Conscience. A man went to confession and told the priest that he had for years been stealing supplies from the lumberyard where he worked. The priest asked, what exactly did you take? The man said, well, enough to build my own home, a house for my son, a house for each of my two daughters, and a vacation home at the lake. The priest paused and said, this is very, very serious. I shall have to think of a big penance. Have you ever done a prayer retreat? The man replied, no, Father, I haven't. But if you can give me the plans, I can get the lumber. <laughs> when you come to Acts chapter 23, Paul makes a statement. I have a clear conscience. Remember, he has been arrested. The Roman commander is trying to ascertain what exactly the crime is that he has committed. And so he decides to have Paul appear before the Jewish Supreme Court, the Sanhedrin, so that they might be able to tell the commander what the charges are. In Acts chapter 22 and verse 30, the next day, since the commander wanted to find out exactly why Paul was being accused by the Jews, he released him and ordered the chief priests and all the Sanhedrin to assemble. Then he brought Paul and had him stand before them. The objective was to figure out what the charge against Paul was. In Acts chapter 23 and verse 1, Paul looked straight at the Sanhedrin. That's a very strong term. I mean, in other words, what's happening is he's staring at them. He's gazing at them. He's looking at them eyeball to eyeball. Why? He knows God is with him. He knows that his conscience is clear. And so with a clear conscience, there is a great confidence. That's the advantage of a clear conscience. There's a confidence that comes to a person when they know they're right before God. And he begins his defense by saying, my brothers, in other words, as he's talking to them, he had at one time served with them. He had at one time studied with them. They knew him and he knew them. Look at what he says. My brothers, I have fulfilled my duty to God in all good conscience to this day. It's a very, very interesting statement. Paul's saying, listen, my conscience is totally clear. What's interesting is this is not the only time Paul says this. This issue of conscience is very, very important to Paul, and it appears several times in the New Testament. You may not be aware of it. Let me give you a few examples, Acts 24 and 16. So I strive always to keep my conscience clear before God and man. In 1 Corinthians, he writes, my conscience is clear. 2 Timothy, he writes, I serve God with a clear conscience. Paul has a clear conscience. And so what I'd like to do is I'd like to do something that maybe we don't preach on very often other than to mention it in passing. But in the next few moments, I want to talk to you about the conscience. Because the Bible says a great deal about our conscience. 
And this is important because we live in a day when secular counselors and psychologists are less concerned with understanding the conscience than they are with attempting to silence it. By dishing out counsel that says guilt is bad and it's not your fault. So when we're talking about the conscience, what we're talking about here is the conscience is a God-given innate ability placed inside each person that helps them to sense right and wrong. It's a God-given innate ability placed inside each person that helps them to discern or decide right from wrong. Every person, including the most wicked person you can imagine, has a conscience. Whether that conscience is functioning or not, everybody's born with one. We know that because in Romans chapter 2 and verse 14, Paul writes this, when outsiders who have never heard of God's law follow it more or less by instinct, they confirm its truth by their obedience. They show that God's law is not something alien imposed on us from without, but woven into the very fabric of our creation. There is something deep within them that echoes God's yes and no, right and wrong. Their response to God's yes and no will become public knowledge on the day God makes his final decision about every man or woman. In other words, what happens is the conscience God has placed in us, and it encourages us to do what we believe is right and restrains us from doing what we believe is wrong. At the same time, it's very important to understand that the conscience is not the voice of God and it's not the voice of the devil. The conscience is a human faculty that judges our thoughts, our actions, and our standards by the highest standard we perceive. When a person violates their conscience, it triggers feelings of shame, Guilt, anguish, regret, anxiety, fear. And if that violation of conscience isn't addressed, it paves the way for greater sinfulness and greater emotional confusion. On the other hand, when a person listens to their conscience, it can bring joy, it can bring peace, it can bring self-respect, it can bring well-being, it can bring gladness. And yet with all of that, it's important for us to understand that the conscience is not infallible. For example, look what Paul says. My conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. So the conscience is human. It can be energized by the Spirit of God, used by God, placed in us by God, but it is not the same as the voice of God. It is not infallible. Nor does the conscience always necessarily reveal right from wrong. In other words, your conscience cannot teach you about right and wrong. All it can do is hold you accountable to the standard that you know. Now, the Bible talks about several different kinds of consciences. First of all, there's the defiled conscience. We read about that in Titus chapter 1 and verse 15. To the pure, all things are pure, but to the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure, but both their minds and their consciences are defiled. Would you notice there's the mind, what you and I think, but there is the conscience, which is a part of the internal working of our soul. And Paul says, you can have a defiled conscience. In other words, if you're not careful, you can mess up your conscience and develop a corrupted conscience. You say, how does that happen? Well, Romans chapter 1 and verse 18, you can just write it down. 
it says you can defile your conscience by ignoring the truth. So the truth is there. It's a, it's a dangerous thing to hear truth and ignore it. It's a dangerous thing spiritually and in the formation and maintenance of the conscience to ignore what you know is right. It's also possible that you can sin so much that your conscience through your own justification of your sinful behavior becomes corrupted and thus over time cannot give you a true reading on your situation. A defiled conscience is warped. And the dangerous thing about a defiled conscience is it's not that it ceases to function, but it can't function correctly. It's, it's like a compass that has a magnet near it. It doesn't work accurately. And a person can, over time, convolute their conscience and their thinking through the justification of sinful behavior. Or another way that a conscience can become defiled is when a person sins and too quickly lets their soul come to rest with that sin. In other words, they're flippant about repentance. They don't let godly repentance have its place in working a sorrow in their heart that is used by the Holy Spirit to not only restore their conscience, but to bring them into a place of close fellowship with God after that sinful behavior has been acknowledged. The result is that a defiled conscience can shipwreck a person's faith. Because once you've decided that you are going to ignore truth, then all of a sudden, truth rather than being absolute, especially when it comes to the Bible, when it becomes relative, when it becomes a matter of I think rather than this is what it says, what happens is people walk away from the faith. In 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 19, Paul says this, holding on to faith, which is not only believing in God, but believing the body of what God has revealed about himself, the faith, and a good conscience. You gotta hold on to a good conscience. You gotta maintain the conscience. You gotta make sure it's in good operating condition. Some have rejected these and have shipwrecked their faith. And then Paul says, among them are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I've handed over to Satan to be taught not to blaspheme. So there is a defiled conscience. Second, there's a seared conscience. First Timothy chapter 4, verse 2, such teachings come through, the hypo through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. What is he describing there? A conscience that has been burned, it's been branded, and now there is a scar that is hard that is no longer sensitive in the way the skin was sensitive before. Seared conscience is one that has been violated so many times that is actually almost like covered with, covered with scar tissue and the prick of truth can't even touch it and it can lead, Romans 1.28, to a depraved mind or conscience. Romans 1.28 says God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper, a darkened mind. In a seared conscience, repeated sin, either justified or ignored, leaves the person in a condition where they have no conviction of sin. I mean, so, I mean, listen, we all understand this. You read the news and you see people do things that are horrific and you say, how can they do that? And then when they speak, it's obvious they have no sense of sorrow over what they have just done, even though it was, it was in every way evil. A seared conscience brings a person to a place where they have no conviction. The, they've grieved the Holy Spirit, which... In Ephesians 4, it tells us, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. But they've grieved him to the point they cannot hear his voice. And here's the problem. The conscience is the soul's warning system. 
The seared conscience then makes that person like an airliner that is on autopilot but has no warning system to tell when the plane is doing something it should not do. And when a plane has no warning system, you can be sure it will crash. There's a third kind of conscience. That would be the weak conscience. And you can read more about it in Romans 14 and 1 Corinthians 8. This is the kind of conscience that is typically hypersensitive about things that are not sin. In other words, the weak conscience is the result of an immature, uninformed, fragile faith that makes things sin that are not. Usually, that conscience manifests itself with a person becoming extremely legalistic. Often people with a weak conscience tend to judge people, other people, when they do things that the person with the weak conscience doesn't feel they are allowed to do or they think are wrong. As well, a person with a weak conscience can find themselves constantly condemned. So, for example, there are some here today and as we're entering into worship, but I'm saying this not in any way to make a person feel bad. I'm saying it by way of explanation to help you grow and be free of something that I think hinders some people. So you come in here and, you know, right away you feel that you can't raise your hands because of the week you've had, or you can't sing because of the conversation you had in the car on the way, and, and so you're feeling terrible. You're feeling like, I can't even really, I don't even feel like praying. I don't even know. You know, so you, you got all this going on, and you feel very condemned in your heart relative to your relationship with God, and truth be told, you feel like God, maybe you know he, he's loves you in the broadest sense, but if you're honest, you feel like maybe it's more like he tolerates you. That's because you have a weak conscience. It's because you have a conscience that has not been trained thoroughly in the Word of God. In 1 John, a very interesting set of verses, my dear children, let's not just talk about love, let's practice real love. This is the only way we'll know we're living truly living in God's reality. Here's what he's saying here. When you and I do the right thing, we're going to feel the right thing. Here's what the, the problem is for a lot of people. They, they let their feelings guide them, and they think that they should feel the right thing, and then they will do the right thing. That's backwards. That's biblically backwards. When I do the right thing, my feelings will follow my actions. This is why if you want a vibrant marriage, love your mate, do the right thing, and you'll feel the right thing. But if you don't do the right thing, you're never going to feel the right thing. Or you seldom will. Paul's saying, do the right thing. Then you'll have the record of your actions to say, listen, I know that I love God, and my life demonstrates that I love God. Now watch what happens. It's also the way to shut down debilitating self-criticism even when there is something to it. So how do you shut down self-criticism? You know, your conscience is saying, how could you say you love God after what you just did? You, you know what I'm saying? You have, that, you have that conversation. What John is saying is you do the right thing. Now you're able to say, you know what? I, I understand that I'm headed in the right direction. When I look at my life, I can see evidence of a love for God by the things that I'm doing in my life. And that way you can speak to yourself, which you have to learn to speak to yourself, and you can say, self, knock it off. Don't tell me I don't love God. I was at Saturday serve, and I was staying in that fence with the best of them, and I was doing it for Jesus, so there, right? Now, here's another aspect to it. For God is greater than our worried hearts, and he knows more about us than we know ourselves. So what you got to do is, you know, your conscience, if it's untrained and it doesn't understand grace, then it's sitting there letting, it's, it's actually beating you up. And you're letting it, and you're believing it. And you've forgotten 
that God is greater than our worried hearts. God sees the big picture. God sees that before time uh, began, he chose you. He loves you. You're the object of his affection. God's got a plan for you, and you're walking in that plan, and the issue is not perfection. It's direction. You're growing. You're getting stronger in Christ. You're becoming more like Jesus, and when you see it in light of grace and God's knowledge, it gives you what? Relief from the condemnation of a weak conscience. Continue on here. And friends, once that's taken care of, we're no longer accusing or condemning ourselves. We're bold before God. You see, a lot of people are not bold in their prayers before God because they have a weak conscience. They don't understand grace. They don't. Every single time they're in the presence of God, they're reminding themselves or they're letting their untrained, weak conscience remind them of a sin they committed long ago and God has forgotten it. But because they don't understand grace, because they don't understand justification by faith, because they don't understand what God did for them on the cross, because they don't understand the ways of God or the grace of God or the power of God or the forgetfulness of God in that this, as far as, our, as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our sins and transgressions from us, if God has done that for you, then why are you still thinking about it? Because you have a weak conscience. And I say that in kindness, but I say it for truth. You have not learned the grace of God and gotten it into your heart enough where it becomes the reality that guides the, the voice of your conscience. Friends, once that's taken care of, we're no longer accusing or condemning ourselves. We're bold and free before God. We're able to stretch our hands out and receive what we ask for because we're doing what he said doing what pleases him. When you have a conscience that's well-trained, you're able to receive from God, you're able to boldly approach God, but when you have a weak, untrained conscience, it will ruin your prayer life. Because it constantly becomes about what you're not and what you've done that's displeased God, and you're never able to boldly approach the throne of grace. You believe then that God might do something for somebody else or listen to somebody else's prayer more than he would do for you or listen to your prayer. And the enemy loves that. The person with the weak conscience has to train their heart to understand their sin in the light of God's grace. You're forgiven, your sin is forgiven, and you are deeply loved by God. Now, when it comes to our conscience as followers of Christ, number one, we have to guard our conscience so that it doesn't become damaged. And number two, we have to train our conscience to discern good from evil. That's what Hebrews is talking about. Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 14, solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. This is, the, this is the power of being regularly in the Word. The more you get the Word of God in you, the more you're going to be able to discern what's right, what's wrong, and the way God thinks about things. It trains you, and in the process of training you, liberates you. All that being said now, what I want to do, and I know when I tell you how many points I have, you're going to be like, what? but I do promise we'll go through these quickly. I wanna give you seven keys to training and guarding your conscience. We'll just move very quickly through this, but I think this is really important. Number one, confess and forsake known sin. Confess and forsake known sin. Examine your guilt feelings in light of Scripture. If what you've done is wrong according to the word of God, then repent. For John 1 9 says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. At the same time, let me say this, if the guilt you feel, if, if, if you can't find in the word of God where it's wrong, then at that point you need to train your conscience. Ask God as well to reveal to your heart unknown sin. Because all of us are capable of doing things either unintentionally 
or doing something and we're not aware of it. And then all of a sudden, later only to find out it was something displeasing to the Lord. I mean, this is what the psalmist has in mind in Psalm 139 and verse 23. Search me, O God. Know my heart. Test me. Know my anxious thoughts. Listen, if there is anxiety, now let me be clearer. I'm not saying every anxiety that a person has is related to this, but I will say I believe much anxiety is based on what's going on in a person's conscience. They have violated their conscience. They've got a weak conscience, all kinds of things that creates anxiety. So he's saying, know my anxious thoughts. If you have anxious thoughts or anxiety, then go to God and say, God, listen, search my heart point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. God, if, if there's something I've done that has offended you, I've got, this, I've got this anxiousness in my heart. Lord, I don't know if I... I'm going to ask you, did I do something that's offended you? Because if I did, please show me. I want to take care of it right now. And when he shows you, take care of it. Repent and go forward. Number two. Ask forgiveness of those you have wronged. Don't say, oh well. Don't chalk it up to your Irish temper. Don't say, well, they know I love them. If you have sinned against them, if you have wronged somebody, make it right. Matthew chapter 5, verse 23, so if you're offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, and honestly, I believe this is something God does often in a worship service. You're in the presence of the Lord. All of a sudden, God brings things to your mind. In fact, I believe he's doing it right now. When we're talking about this, there's some of you and you're thinking right away of a situation, a circumstance where you've wronged somebody. Here's the counsel. Leave your gift before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. In other words, be right with people and then you'll be right with God. Number three, make restitution. In the Old Testament, when you wrong someone, you had to make it right. And if you took something from somebody, then you had to add uh, 20% to it. You returned it plus gave them 20% of the value of the thing you took. You see this idea in the New Testament when Zacchaeus comes in contact with Christ in Luke chapter 19. He says, you know, Lord, if I've wronged anybody, I'll pay him back four times. Paul says to Philemon, he says, if Onesimus owes you anything, charge it to my account. In other words, there's this desire to make people whole, to rectify what's wrong. Genuine repentance wants to make it right. I'm sorry and repentance are not the same. And especially when you say, I'm sorry you feel that way. When people, when I hear that, I just get a spirit of slap. You know, it's just, you just want to slap somebody's face and say, what in the world? Sorry you feel that way. That's, that's like pouring salt in the wound, really. Make it right. If you stole something, give it back. Or buy a new one and give it back. If you told somebody a lie, go back and correct it and make it true. If you told them the truth in a way that believe, caused them to believe less than the truth, you need to go back and rectify that. Number four, I think this one is really important. Don't procrastinate in clearing your wounded conscience. Now, let me just say, whenever the Holy Spirit speaks to your heart, do it. The longer you wait, the harder it will be to do. This is true of everything. So if he speaks to you about going in and witnessing to somebody gets harder the longer you wait. He speaks to you about going and praying for somebody, harder the longer you wait. He speaks to you about giving something, either to the church or to somebody, harder the longer you wait. The Holy Spirit speaks to you, act on it quickly. Some people put off dealing with their guilt, thinking that their conscience will clear itself in time, but it won't. 
And here's the problem with waiting for your conscience to clear. Because what happens is procrastination allows the guilt feelings to fester inside you, which in turn generates depression. Again, so I'm going to name some things, and I'm not saying everybody who experiences those things, this is the cause. I'm just simply suggesting it may be. So when you allow the, the, you're not dealing with it, you've got the guilt feelings, you know you did wrong, you're not dealing with it, you're not making it right, what that does over time, it generates feelings of depression, anxiety, and other emotional and physical problems. And, and then what happens, guilt feelings can persist long after an offense has been forgotten and then spills over into other areas of a person's life, which is why you have people who feel guilty, but they aren't sure why. Because it does not go away. You can move it to the back of your mind, but eventually it comes back. So don't procrastinate in clearing your wounded conscience. Number five, educate your conscience. A weak, easily grieved conscience is the result of a lack of spiritual knowledge. But at the same time, the way to deal with a weak conscience is not to just override it, ignore it. That could result in overriding potentially a genuine conviction of sin. So you have to be very, very careful. And let me just say this. Don't ever encourage people to sin against their conscience. You say, like, what do you mean? So, like, there's, you have people, and maybe they believe something is wrong that you don't believe is wrong. So cards, cards, playing cards. You're like, sin? I didn't know that was a sin. Well, you probably like me, where he's Presbyterian. We played cards all the time. But when I started dating Debbie, she never played playing cards. And I mean, I'd grown up playing all kinds of card games. And, and um, she was like, no, nah, that's, that's wrong. That's sin. And I was like, not sin. And, you know, I went to college and was called the ministry. And I went to CBC. And I mean, I found out nobody plays playing cards. They all play Rook, you know, which... What's the difference? I mean, you know, but that's what they did. They played, played Rook, and that's the Assemblies of God card game, or at least was back in that day. <laughs> I'm having fun. Okay, so anyway, don't go to somebody and say, well, that's no big deal, and make them feel bad or make them feel stupid or use peer pressure on whatever it is that they feel is wrong, and you're like, no, it's not. You say, what do you do? Well, let me give you this scripture first, Romans 14. If you have doubts about whether or not you should eat something, so the issue here is meat offered to idols. And in Paul's day, Paul says, an idol is nothing, and meat offered to idols is nothing. If you give thanks to God, dig in, have the steak. But there were some people who were like, no, if it's offered to an idol, that would be sinful. So here's Paul's counsel. If you have doubts about whether or not you should eat something, you are sinning if you go ahead and do it. So if it's wrong for you, it's wrong for you. But don't take what's wrong for you and superimpose that on everybody else like it's wrong for them. If it's not in the Bible, I mean, come on. And even within the, the way we live life, there used to be a track um, some of you know Jim Cimbala. He pastored the Brooklyn Tabernacle. He pulled it out of his wallet one time. It's an old, old track. And the title of it is, Others May, But You May Not. So as you and I are walking with the Lord, there are some things God puts his hand on your life and says, I don't want you to do that anymore. Doesn't necessarily mean it's sin for other people to do it. It's just God saying, for you, that's, I don't want you to do that anymore. Others may, but you may not. So if something is not right to you, but it's not clearly in the Bible wrong, then keep that between you and the Lord, but don't run around and be the God squad and try to impose your, what God has spoken to your heart or what you feel is part of your serving God in holiness. And I'm not saying that facetiously. I'm saying it literally. As we walk with the Lord, there are times God says, I don't want you to do this. Could be what you listen to, styles of music, 
You know, he may tell you, listen, you can listen to this and this, but no country music. You know, so. <laughs> Teasing. Okay. Maybe not. Okay. <laughs> For you are not following your convictions. If you do anything you believe is not right, you're sinning. So if you do something you believe is not right, you're sinning against your conscience. So back to the card deal. So you say, I've got somebody, and they have something like that, and, and I think their, their conscience, they need to understand this is not a Bible deal. Then what you do is you begin to walk them through the Scripture, you pray together, and you disciple them through it for the purpose of helping them know their liberty in Christ and ultimately seeing them grow closer to Christ, right? Our goal is never to see somebody serve Jesus with less zeal and fervor, right? So we train our conscience. You immerse your conscience in the Word of God. You make the Word of God your standard, not the traditions of men. Now, you can't train your conscience by your feelings. Your feelings may be right, may be wrong. Feelings just are, but you cannot build your life on how you feel. You have to build your life on your convictions. And you have to train your conscience according to the Word of God. How do you do that? Well, listening to messages, being in a life group, getting around people, letting people talk it through. Listen, it's good to hear how God is working in other people's lives, and it keeps you from from veering off the path, because discipleship, becoming more like Christ, is not a do-it-yourself project. And if you don't have other voices speaking into you and into your life, you will become weird. <laughs> and that's not God's will. That's why you've got to have people around you who can help you so you're learning, you're being encouraged in the Word of God. The conscience has to be trained to see both our failings and our faith in the light of God's grace. Otherwise, it will become overly accusing and prone to causing a person to doubt their standing before God, and you'll constantly be thinking you're unworthy. So again, this is why it's good to get in a life group. This is why it's good to talk about these things so that you can be freed from that so when you come in here, you don't have an accusing conscience working against you. Number six, study and obey the Word of God. Psalm 119 says this, how can a young man keep his way pure? By living according to your word. I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. Verse 11, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. That is such a good practice. So if there's an area where you struggle, an area of sinfulness, ask the Lord to give you a scripture that addresses that. And then memorize it. Hide it in your heart and use it. Draw it like a sword every time the sword is the Word of God. Draw it and use it to fight the enemy and to fight the flesh and to fight temptation. Let the Word of God train you. Let the Word of God revive you. Psalm 19 says this in verse 7, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. It, it makes you new. And number seven, respond quickly to the prompting of the Holy Spirit. There's a statement that appears three times in Hebrews chapter 3 and once in Hebrews chapter 4. And it's this statement this is the first time it appears, Hebrews 3, 7. That is why the Holy Spirit says, today when you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts. In other words, when the Holy Spirit comes to convict you, listen, when, when the Holy Spirit comes to convict, it's not for the purpose of condemnation, it's for the purpose of restoration. Repentance that leads to restoration and renewal of relationship. So when you hear his voice, don't ignore his voice. When he's speaking to you, 
Don't put it off. Don't ignore what he's saying. So go back to Acts chapter 23. Paul says, I fulfilled my duty to God in all good conscience to this day. He'll say in 2 Corinthians this, which I think is such an amazing statement. We can say with confidence and a clear conscience that we have lived with a God-given holiness and sincerity in all our dealings. Can you say that? Can you say with confidence, I've lived with a God-given holiness. I've lived with sincerity. You could translate it integrity. I'm living in integrity in every area of my life. I'm doing that. It's an amazing statement. But if Paul is making that statement, it's because Paul is saying to us, follow me as I follow Christ. He's saying this is the standard. This is where we should be living. There's power when you're living there. There's peace when you're living there. There's joy when you're living there. There's there's a fullness of faith when you're living there. So I want to ask you a question. Do you have a clear conscience? Could it be that as I've been talking, there have been things that have come up in your mind? I, I believe so. I believe that's the way it works. The Holy Spirit begins to address us as we hear the word of God spoken. Puts his finger on certain things and says, this is an area that I want to help you with. If you don't have a clear conscience, maybe it's because you're tolerating sin in your life. And the danger with that is if you tolerate it long enough, it not only defiles or warps your conscience, but it can ultimately sear your conscience where the Holy Spirit has nothing left to say. And if he was speaking, your conscience so seared you couldn't hear his voice. Or maybe it's because you don't know Jesus and you've never opened your heart to him. And that's why you don't have a clear conscience. Or maybe it's because you knew him at one time and now you find yourself in a backslidden condition where you're living away from him. You know, for some people, the conscience screams so loudly about their sinfulness, they don't know what to do. And maybe that's you. Maybe you're saying, you know, John, I, you, you really don't know where I've done and you treat this like somehow I can just move on. Like I can somehow get beyond it. And I don't, I don't know how I can. And I don't know whether God will accept me, even if I could. Listen to this, Hebrews 9. Just think how much more the blood of Christ will purify our consciences from sinful deeds so that we can worship the living God. Isn't that beautiful? The blood of Jesus can cleanse your conscience. The hymn writer put it this way, there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners there beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. Amazing, isn't it? He can clean your conscience. He can make it like new. He wants to, he will, he does it to people who look to him. Thank you so much for joining James River Church on our YouTube channel. Our prayer is that you were encouraged and your faith was strengthened today. And we wanna let you know that we'd love for you to be a part of our online family. As well, we'd love if you subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell for notifications. You'll be so glad you did because we're always putting out great sermons, new worship content, and it helps you know when we go live for our weekly services. We hope you have an amazing day and thank you again for watching. God bless.